Hello, welcome back. Uh, this exercise we're going to be looking at sampling distributions uh, once more, this time with the finite population that we're going to be drawing from. Uh, so we need to take into consideration the possibility that we'll need the finite population correction factor. Basically what that is, uh, is to correct for the amount of variability that would exist in our sample as our sample approaches the limits of this finite population. So for example, if, if we're looking at, um, you know, if this is my population, so this contains all of the observations. So let's look at our, our problem uh, at hand, where we're looking at uh, my home university here, we have a population of 25,748 students. So let's say that th this, this black circle contains all of those 25,700 uh, students. Now, if we sample from this, let's say I take a, a sample that is relatively small uh, compared to that population. Well, there's a lot of variability that might exist. Right? That sample could come from anywhere. Now it looks like a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> there could be a lot of different small samples that could come out of that population. We could figure that out with um, combinations uh, calculation. Now, as our sample gets larger and larger, there become fewer and fewer possible samples, and will our sample will become increasingly um, reflective of the population itself. So if I get a really big sample, that's almost the entire population, my point estimates of the mean are going to be getting closer and closer and closer to the true population values. So what we, <clears throat> what we do when we're calculating the standard error, which is really just the distributions of sample means that may come out of a population, we would have a, a function that would look something like this, n minus n over n minus one, n times sigma root n. <clears throat> so this piece here is what we call this correction factor. As our population grows, so let's say our population is infinite in size, so capital N here is infinite in size, well then this correction factor is going to approach one. And so this is why when we're looking with uh, infinite, infinitely large populations, our standard error is just this term here. Our standard error is nothing more than this. When that <coughs> population uh, is infinitely large. When our finite population approaches an infinitely large population, well, we can use uh, this, same, uh, this same calculation. And there's a simple rule for that. If, if the ratio of our sample size to the population, if that's less than uh, 0.05, then we can just use this function to calculate the standard error. But if that finite population is relatively small compared to our sample, well then it might be the case that the sample that I'm taking is almost all of, or at least getting closer to the entire population. And so if that's the case, there becomes less and less and less and less variability in the nature of those samples. Right, if I have lots of small samples, right, there might be a lot of different type, different samples that come out of there. If I'm taking very large samples, well, there's fewer and fewer and fewer possible samples. I am getting closer and closer and more and more consistent to estimating the true population parameters. So this value here is then going to approach zero because the distribution of sample means as my sample becomes closer and closer to the population, well, that, that standard error becomes less relevant. We don't need it anymore because now we're not sampling. Now we're just looking at the entire population. So enough about that. Let's get into our exercise here. So first question, uh, we've got our population of just under 26,000 students, average age of 20, uh, 25.1. We take a sample of 200 students, uh, do we need to use this correction factor? Well, as I just said, uh, we only uh, we only need it if this is greater than 0.05. We don't need it if this is less than or equal to 0.05. So if we just put in these numbers, our sample size is 200 divided by the population 748. 
this is going to be equal to, where's my little calculator here? 200 divided by 25,748, 0,078. So our finite population, although finite, is sufficiently large uh, that we don't need this this calculation, or sorry, this uh, correction factor. So our answer here, no. Now part B, we'll kind of look at why. What might be the difference if we between using it and not using it, given the large size of that finite population? So if we have a population standard deviation here, 536. So let's first assume uh, an infinitely large population, or the case that, that we have our, our finite population is large enough uh, that we can just use this calculation. So this is 536 divided by the square root of 200. And so here we're going to have 5.36 divided by square root of 200. So 0.38. Well, let's keep it to three decimals actually. 0.379. So there's there's what we would use given that our finite population is so large, but what if we did correct for it? What if we did use that correction factor? 25,748 minus 200 divided by 25,748 minus 1 uh, times this, which we already calculated, 379. So this is going to be, let's see, 25,748 minus 200 divided by 25,747 equals square root 996 times. So it's practically 1, which of course means it's really not going to have any impact times 379. It's really not going to have any impact on our measure here, 378, if I round it. So only a slight difference at the third decimal place. It's trivial. It's irrelevant. We don't need it. So given that our sample size is small relative to a large finite population, uh, we certainly don't need to have that population, uh, finite population correction factor. So here for my answer, uh, I'm just going to write in our 379 compared to or versus 378. Okay, good. Part C, let's calculate some probabilities now because of course that's what we need this for, right? If we're, if we're gonna try to make inference about the population based on a sample, well, we need to, of course, have some information about the distribution of those samples. And now we can calculate what's the probability that if I draw a sample of size 200, what's the probability that it will be within half a year or six months of the true population mean, which in this case we happen to know. So what I need to do here again, when we're working with these types of problems, it's helpful to keep in mind that we're working with two distributions simultaneously, right? There's our, our distribution uh, of, of observations, so this is that distribution of ages with a mean of 25.1. And this is our standard normal distribution with a mean of zero. This one has a standard deviation of 536. This one has a standard deviation of one. And of course, we also know this one has the standard error uh, with a sample size of 200. That standard error we calculated here is 0 0.379. So what we want to now calculate is the probability that if I draw a sample of size 200, that it falls within half a year. So that's going to be somewhere between uh, 24.6 and 25.6. Uh, so we're looking at uh, half a year spread on either side or one year uh, interval around that mean. Now what we need to do is is to translate that into a z-score so that I can then look at that probability, so call this z1 and z2, which we'll have to solve, and we're looking for this area under the curve here 
which would be the probability that we're looking for. So I'm going to calculate Z2 first because our distribution tables, remember if I pull up the table, oops, there's some other nonsense on here. Our distribution tables are always giving us those cumulative probabilities. So it's always the area to the left, right? And so I have one, my Z2 is up here and my Z1 is somewhere here. So what I'm gonna calculate is this area. So I'll have Z2, and then I'm going to calculate the probability for Z1, which will then just be, let me get a different color, that'll then just be the blue area. So then if I subtract the blue area, or the probability for Z1, subtract that from the probability for Z2, that will give me the difference, right? That'll give me then just that red space. So let's come back to our problem. So Z2, uh, for both of these cases, I'm gonna be looking at that difference. So here's 25.6 minus 25.1 over the standard error, which is 536 over root 200. So this is going to be 0.5 divided by, we've already calculated the standard errors, 379. And so this is going to give us a value, 0.5 divided by 0.379. So a value of 1.32. Okay, so there's 1.32. So the probability of a z value less than or equal to 1.32, right? That's the area, the lower tail or cumulative probability corresponding to 132. Here I'm going to scroll down. Here's 1.32, and so that gives me a value of 0 0.9066. Okay. So that's uh, point, point 0.9066, that's getting, my, my writing gets messier and messier the more I write, 0 0.9066, okay? Now I want the probability that corresponds to Z1, and the calculation is going to be, uh, well, I'll do it, and you'll see what, you'll see what we're gonna have. So now I'm looking at 24.6 minus 25.1. The standard error is the same, so I'm just gonna write this down. And of course here you see well that numerator is still the same, 0.5 over 0.379. And so what we're gonna have now, of course, let me get the calculator out. Oh, this is a negative 0.5, my mistake. And so our, our calculation now is gonna be exactly the same, right? We'll have negative 1.32. There's a, 0.5 negative divided by 0.379, wouldn't you know it, negative 3.2, uh, 132, negative 132. And so if we go to the tables, negative, oops, negative 132, uh, where are we here, negative 1.32, there we go, 0 0.0934. So my probability there that Z is less than or equal to negative 132.09, let me double check, 0934. Okay, so there's this probability here. This is the blue. Oh, I wanted blue. So this is the space here. So now we need to subtract this from this and we'll get this area between those two. So, uh, 0.9066 minus 0.0934 equals 81.32. So the probability uh, that Z is less than 132 greater than negative 132 that is equal to 0 0.8132. And that's the answer to our problem here, 0 0.8132. That's the probability that X bar lies between those two 
those two limits. So there we have it, 81% chance that if I take a sample of size 200, that the sample mean will be between 24.6 and 25.6. Good, that's all there is to it. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.